Let's start then with the kind of role that they play, because gangs really do play a prominent role in Night City, correct? Yes, definitely. The gangs, they rule the streets of Night City. You know, they have the newest cyberware, they have the newest weaponry, and they are really a power that everyone needs to take into account when they are thinking of operating in Night City. You will encounter them as you explore the city, of course, but also as you complete main quests, side quests, uh, different jobs for the, for the fixers. Uh, sometimes you might even get hired by them. Who are the nine primary gangs in and around Night City? Unfortunately, V as a merc will never be trusted enough to join them, but there are a plethora of style perks, aesthetics and collectibles from vehicles to weapons. So we've obviously mentioned distinct style then. So does that mean there are kind of special gang themed weapons and items and clothing for players to find and use? Yes, definitely. There are different vehicles that you can drive, for example. There are cars, there are motorbikes. Um, then, of course, there are different uh, pieces of clothing uh, themed after gangs. Uh, there are weapons and so on. So, yeah, definitely there are things to look forward to. So, if you cannot join a gang per se, the moral dilemma then becomes who will you, as the player, pick to represent if any, in game. To best ask and answer this, here is a full breakdown of each gang's history, philosophy, and rivalries in Cyberpunk 2077. From the Sixth Street to the Valentinos, it's time to introduce you to the gangs of Night City. You know how things work in Night City? The stronger survive, but that's how things stand. You're either somebody, or you fizzle out into nothing. Then see ain't a city that lets you get by without buddies. Be very careful, my friend. We are all so far from home. Which gang's the city's biggest and baddest, according to the NCPD? Scavs hold the body count title. Or Maelstrom, depending on the season. One time, a Maelstrom ganger killed a young kid right in front of my eyes for shits and giggles. Chrome sucking psychos. And who the f are you to say what can and can't be? I'm gonna introduce you to our meat grinder. The Maelstrom were originally a combat gang formed from what was left of the Metal Warriors, a gang that was almost completely wiped out by the Inquisitors. Maelstrom members are known to dress in leather and chrome, prefer visible high-profile cyberware, and in general, appear primitive and dangerous. There's fully a third of them that are clinical cyber psychos, and another third of them that are borderline. Back when they were the Metal Warriors, they held a code of honor. When their original leader, Hammer, was thrown out, the code of honor went as well, and now they will attack anyone. In 2077, the Maelstrom gang is located in the All Foods plant in Night City. With 1,300 members, they are led by Royce after he deposed and imprisoned the last boss, Brick. They are known to have heavy combat augmentation as well as using pain suppressors, reflex boosters, and street mod optical units of unknown capabilities. Maelstrom's territory is the industrial part of Watson, its factories, the Totem Tense Club, and they are obsessed with cyber technology and their urge to improve the weakness of human flesh is far stronger than their fear of cyber psychosis. The Maelstrom gang are fanatics when it comes to cyberware, the net, the occult, and the pursuit of otherworldly sensation. They partition their organization into smaller groups, each responsible for a different part of their criminal empire. Depending on the task, these groups can be as large as 30 members for raids, hit jobs, or protecting valuable cargo, or as many as four or five if patrolling their own turf. The main revenue for Maelstromers comes from smuggling illegal meds and drugs. They also perform hit jobs, which they execute in a bizarre and brutal fashion. Many victims are found dismembered, skinned alive, or found in wet concrete. They also perform well-planned and executed heists on guarded corporate transports. Another prominent source of income is the Totem Tans Club, the most popular gangster club and drink and riot venue in Night City. Totem Tans is located in an abandoned factory where other gangers go to party and listen to neo-death metal music as 
long as they obey the Maelstrom's authority and customs. If a night at TTC has a body count less than a dozen, it's considered crappy and boring. Rumors say that the gang is involved in the production of black market brain dance records, especially bizarre, disturbing, and extremely violent ones. Other records they are rumored to produce are called Numbness, an emotional void that places users in a strange state of mind, which are quite popular among overstimulated BD users. Despite these rumors, the NCPD has found no evidence to prove the Maelstrom are involved in the brain dance black market. About time we had some fun! Big Maelstrom never forgets! Never! <laughs> I hate these Borg f***ers. I'll take the Valentinos. They follow God and the Santa Madre. Honor means something to them. How'd you meet Jackie? We started out together. In the Valentinos? No, in the fuck Bible Book Club. I gotta give style points to the Valentinos. They have a punishment for every occasion. Gangster life, puto. Originally, the Valentino started as a poser gang dedicated to seducing the most attractive women in Night City. The more unobtainable she appears to be, the more attractive a target she makes. The Valentinos, by 2077, are one of the largest gangs in Night City with a membership of about 6,000. Strictly territorial, they operate in the vast, impoverished Latino barrios in Haywood, the Glen, and Vista del Rey, where they are strongly rooted in the local communities. They're representatives of the Chicano culture of Night City and have cultivated those traditions for more than a century. Valentinos openly display their gang tattoos and gold jewelry with religious motifs the Santa Merte and Jesus Malverde being the most popular and recognizable. They also have a taste for colorful clothes, pimped out lowriders, and silver and gold-plated guns. Cyberware is used by the gang, including reflex boosters, auto loaders, and augmented cyber limbs. The majority of Valentino members are of Mexican heritage, but other races and ethnic groups are welcome to join. Members tend to integrate quickly, adopting Chicano culture and celebrating various Mexican holidays and customs like Dia de Los Muertos, Quincianeras, Samana Santa, or Dia de Nuestra Señora de Guadalupe. I'm sorry for the pronunciation. I'm Australian. I don't pronounce R's or I can't roll them, so I just butchered that. I'm aware of this. Moving on. This sense of common heritage, or at least shared customs, binds the gangs with the local people to form one big family. The community's loyalty protects the gang members, which makes NCPD and corporate infiltrations into the gang almost impossible. In return, the Valentinos protect the whole neighborhood. It's for these reasons that betraying one's gang is the most heinous crime a Valentino can commit and is usually punished with a particularly gruesome death. On the other hand, Valentinos who die fighting other gangs, police or corporate enforcers are often remembered as saints and martyrs. These people are commemorated as in song and depicted on giant murals. This memorial street art functions as religious iconography complete with written descriptions of the saint's glorious deeds. In terms of income, the Valentinos own many legitimate businesses such as restaurants, auto shops, and nightclubs, but they also operate brain dance studios, sports betting parlors, and local construction companies. Any of these could be used as a stage for criminal activity, as meeting places, money laundering operations, or as illegal chop shops for stolen vehicles. Their main source of income are gun smuggling, car theft, drug trafficking, robbery, burglary, hit jobs, including assault or murder, prostitution, and illegal modification of weapons and vehicles. Quick shout out to everyone in Haywood in Santo Domingo. Lately, the Valentinos and 6th Street have had a bigger bone to pick. Shot, shot, shot. Any more Second Amendment fans in the house, huh? Uh. The 6th Street Gang was founded by old-fashioned American patriots who came together to act as an ad hoc police force. They've since foregone their original goal of serving public trust and are no different than any other gang who abuse their power and position in local communities. They regularly force smaller neighborhood businesses to pay tribute and protection money and are known to engage in various and outright criminal activities. The uniforms of the 6th Street Gangers are heavily influenced by military and patriotic accents. 
military boots, tactical vests, and knee pads, cargo pants, baseball caps with old USA flags, stars, stripes, and eagles. And the cyberware used by the gang includes cyber optics, pain editors, and health monitors. The gang itself consists of about 2,300 members. Sixth Street was formed about 50 years before 2077 by veterans of the Fourth Corporate War, who were tired of the local gangs and helplessness of the NCPD and decided to take matters into their own hands. They gathered some equipment, refreshed themselves on their training, and then took to the streets. The gang was created to keep thugs and hoodlums at bay, and the charismatic leaders gave people a way to protect themselves and seek retribution for the damage caused by other gangs. Sixth Street Gangers today are veterans of more recent conflicts, retired military and discharged corporate security officers who were unable to find other employment. The rest of the gang consists of civilians who received military training after joining the gang. Their main motivation is to bring justice to the city, but their interpretation of the law is questionable and self-serving. The main headquarters of the gang is in Arroyo, but other districts in their control have their own local headquarters that are responsible for patrolling the neighborhood and monitoring the gang's facilities. The Sixth Street's operations include robbery, extortion, and gun smuggling. The group has extensive connections with no bad groups outside of the city itself, and the gang also steals and modifies cars. Sixth Street has talented techies and runs many garages and workshops around the city. They offer services such as combat taxi for hire, which makes them especially popular among edge runners and mercenaries. Despite their criminal nature, the gang is mostly tolerated by corporations and police forces, unless Sixth Street gangers cause trouble outside their established turf. Military-oriented corporations have customers for high-end products, and the NCPD's job is made easier by the law that the gang maintains in their neighborhoods. Hate those bastards. Vomit lofty patriotic bullshit all day. Time to bring on the future. Any idea how many attacks from behind the black wall we neutralized? If the voodoo boys breach the black wall, we'll all be fucked. The voodoo boys, best runners in town. You do not steal from the voodoo boys. I see you always. For them, Pacifica's just Haiti 2.0, their own island, cut off from the rest of the city. This is our turf, our home. Until last week, the animals crawled in. Voodoo Boys are a mysterious gang from Pacifica with a dark reputation for their net running skills and their mystical voodoo flavor. Presumed to be entirely consistent of members of the Haitian blood, the Voodoo Boys are exclusive, secretive, and distrustful of outsiders. The gang was originally comprised of voodoo priests and priestesses, the prominent caste in Creole culture in the Haitian dysphoria. In 2062, climate change wiped Haiti off the face of the earth and initiated a new chapter of the Voodoo Boys history. The gang became the self-appointed guardians of Haitian refugees' interests and safety in the Pacifica combat zone. Most Voodoo Boys are net runners, so cooling suits and neural implants are common elements of a member's outfit, complemented with Voodoo-flavored elements like dreadlocks, tattoos, and the bones and skulls of small birds and rodents worn as charms. Cyberware used by the gang includes cyber decks, and neural links. Due to the homogenous nature of the Creole Dispora in the Pacifica, coupled with a lack of police forces in the district, it is difficult to determine the Voodoo Boys' numbers, structure, or even goals. It is widely known that the gang is determined to uncover the secrets of the old net, and it's commonly believed that they probe the dangerous black wall in hope of making contact with the rogue intelligence systems beyond the barrier. However, the outcome could be catastrophic. These attempts, of course, have drawn the attention and enmity of Netwatch, who are interested in tracking down and dispatching rogue netrunners and self-aware systems. Although their edge-running ways are known, it is still unknown to what extent, if any, the Voodoo Boys are connected with actual Voodoo religious practices in the Haitian dysphoria of Pacifica by the events of 2077. The gang's primary source of income involves hacking data banks and accounts with various corporations in search of restricted and top-secret data. They persistently violate Netwatch laws and regulations, especially in regards to contact with ISs. The Voodoo Boys also hire themselves out as mercenary netrunners for private contractors who are interested in hit-and-run netrunning operations or exploring ruined parts of the old net. Other sources of income are hard to verify, but theft of virtual currency and information brokering are probably among them. Voodoo boys. Urban myth, I thought. Just 
let runners spook in each other. No such gang. This is our turf, our home. Until last week, the animals crawled in. Animals are the craziest fucking gang in the city. Breaker Skull! Animals aren't the play here, are they? They're hired muscle. Someone else needed them. The animals are fascinated with the feral, primal side of human nature. They view this aspect as the border between man and animal and are each on a personal quest to establish themselves as a new dominant human subspecies. To achieve this, they constantly subject themselves to brutal and violent tests of skill. They'll often take on dangerous cyber implanted opponents, be they members of other gangs, police or corporate forces. They train in fighting sports, not for philosophical reasons, but to sharpen their effectiveness in combat. Internal gang relations are obviously equally animalistic. On their own impermanent turf, animals are divided into small packs, led by the biggest and strongest member, the alpha male or female. Disputes are often solved with trial by combat, which is fought until one side completely submits. Animals are known mostly for their ultra-violent raids on residential districts and other gangs' home turf. They organize illegal underground fights and manufacture and sell drugs, mostly custom-brew anabolic steroids. A few packs specialize in raiding drugstores, chemical transport, pharmaceutical companies, and drug dealers. Some hire themselves out as bouncers at brothels and strip clubs, or as racketeers who specialize in extortion and assault. By the time of Cyberpunk 2077, the animals are involved in a gang gang war with the Voodoo Boys and are based in the Grand Imperial Mall in Pacifica. The animals are an aggressive street fighting gang with no permanent turf. Their members are known to abstain from the most common electronic implants in favor of custom brewed body enhancements and modifications. They use ultra testosterone and animal supplements, including horse growth hormones, to make themselves bigger and stronger. Experienced as brawlers, they're trained in various forms of martial arts. Animals are also keen on cage fights, duels, and other displays of brute physical force. Their ferocity and toughness makes them sought after bouncers and bodyguards. And they typically sport tattoos and hooligan hoods, as well as some artificial animalistic features, ranging from purely cosmetic changes like spotted or striped skin and subdermal implants to extreme plastic surgery and cybernetic modifications like beast jewel jewel and vat-grown implanted muscles. Cyberware used by the gang include pain editors, combat drug injectors, and augmented cyber limbs. I fuck you over, you fuck the gang over. Somewhere at the start of the story, somebody fuck the corp. See how this works now? My husband's new Westbrook, very high in the tiger claws. They did what made the best eddies, sold sex and black market tech. Mm. See a lot of tigers, they run this place. Know what else they do well? Break the knees of people who ask questions. The Tiger Claws are a ruthless territorial gang based in Japantown. They're one of the largest gangs in Night City with a number of 5,500 members. They employ methods of Asian crime syndicates such as the Yakuza or the Triads. The gang is predominantly Asian and the primary goal is to maintain control over their own territory and occasionally annex other gangs' businesses. Tiger Foot soldiers are easily recognized by their Asian luminous tattoos, fast street bikes, katanas, and tantos. Cyberware used by the gang are reflex boosters, augmented cyber limbs, pain editors, and ECM systems disguised as tattoos. Philosophy and structure. The business strategy of the Tiger Claws is similar to the Yakuza. Crossing the lowest member can cause a quick and violent reaction from the entire gang, but if they get what they want, everything should be fine. The top brass of the claws believe business is preferable to war in the long run, but many of the rank and file TC gangers are sadistic brutes prone to violence. Abduction, torture, sexual assault, and cruel or unusual killings are just a few examples of their depravity. It's not uncommon for young, brash, or drunk tigers to undermine the gang's ideologies by abusing their status on their turf, harassing outsiders, and provoking fights. This behavior would be considered dishonorable by the TC crime bosses, but an outsider reacting to gangers' behavior in kind will rarely go unpunished. Most provoked people outside of the gang's ranks wisely avoid direct confrontation with tigers unless they have connections with high-ranking members of the gang. Source of Income Japantown is Night City's lead nightlife district, and the tigers control a significant portion of it. They own more businesses in Night City than any other gang. 
bars, restaurants, brain dance clubs, brothels, and casinos. Many of these businesses are registered as legal businesses, but act as fronts for illegal operations and money laundering. The gang makes most of its money from human trafficking and prostitution. The Tiger Claws also make money from manufacturing and distributing drugs, most notably glitter. Tigers also are known to hire themselves out for hit jobs. The gang also has corporate connections who visit their establishments to blow off steam and have fun. The Claws have especially close ties to Arasaka's upper management who outsource them side jobs, pay them with cyber technology and military grade automatic weapons. I gotta do something. Shut the f up. The tigers will kill us. Come on, baby. Tiger Claws killed one girl too many, so people took matters into their own hands. Folk went ballistic. Girls, pimps, outcasts, the whole freak show. It's how the mocks got started. Think you're some kind of gang group now, huh? Us moxes have each other's backs. We look out for one another. The mocks formed during the riots that occurred after the death of Elizabeth Borden, a well-known strip club owner and former prostitute who was fair when treating her workers and even defended them from violent clients in 2076. One of Lizzie's girls was brutally raped and murdered by tiger claw gangers. Lizzie avenged her by killing three of the assailants with an axe and displaying their bodies in front of her club, proclaiming that the same would happen to anyone else who hurt a prostitute. That night, Tiger Claws raided and demolished her bar before killing Elizabeth. These actions created an uproar that the Tigers could not have foreseen. Lizzie's death set off a wave of protracted riots all over Night City, and Tiger Claw members and businesses became the main targets of the violence. Those events cemented Elizabeth Borden as a symbol of defiance against gangers, lawlessness, and brutality. Her ideological successes commemorated her by rebuilding her place and naming it Lizzie's Bar, and forming a gang that brought together those who felt threatened and oppressed, especially among sex workers and sexual minorities. The mocks don't have a strict hierarchy, however, but nevertheless, they are a gang. And regardless of the fact that its members refer to themselves as those who protect working girls and guys from violence and abuse, they demand substantial fees from their charges. They also run several smaller brothels where they profit from prostitution, so they are far from being saints. The Mox Gang is relatively small, non-territorial, and consists of mostly sex workers, anarchists, punks, and sexual minorities. Formed in 2076 in the interest of mutual self-defense purposes, their name comes from the old slang term Moxie, denoting their determination to stand up against their oppressors. The Mox like to wear outfits that are a mix of the punk aesthetic and the inexpensive fashion worn typically by prostitutes. However, they do do not wear clothes that would restrain their movements in any way, leaving them looking more like gangers than your typical sex workers. Some members, especially those who focus on combat, have heavily modified bodies that sometimes evoke a plastic doll style, but may be distinguished with real skin. One of their gang symbols is a labrous double-headed axe displayed on their wall, clothes, tattoos, or jewelry. Most of the Mox's income is generated by Lizzie's Bar itself, which is now an exclusive brain dance club. They don't actually control any contiguous portion of Night City, focusing instead on protecting their facilities, members and sex workers who operate in the vicinity of Lizzie's Bar. As long as they're left to their business, they do not actively seek confrontation with other gangs, although they have tense relations with Tiger Claws, who continue to test their patience and combat capabilities. You looking for some company tonight? How'd you hook up with the Mox? I thought Susie and the gang could really change something in this city. Tell me about the Badlands. Not much going on out here, huh? Au contraire. Moxes and nomads don't seem so different. Both seem to yammer a lot about community, solidarity. The Wraiths are the largest group of Wrath and Shith, or rogue nomads. This group travels mostly at night and preys on the sleeping and unwary. One of their known leaders was named Dog Killer and is rumored to wear clothing of human skin. The Wraiths are also one of two prominent nomad groups inhabiting the Badlands. They have a long history of frequent conflict and warring with the other nomad group, the Aldicados. The Wraiths also have a custom near 1,000 horsepower car that they roam the Badlands in called the Reaver. 
While nomads usually operate in a judicial grey area, the wraiths ignore the law. They're vicious as well as aggressive and have dominated the areas surrounding Night City. They raid small villages as well as attack small groups of nomads and attack weakly guarded corp transports. Cyberware and other equipment used by the gang include reflex boosters, pain editors, heavily modified vehicles and possibly military grade equipment. The origins of the Wraiths, however, are unknown. What is known is that they are one of a dozen nomad-originated gangs on the West Coast, presumably consisting of exiles from nomad nations. The size of the gang is unknown, but they are presumably the size of an average nomad clan, about 300 to 1,200 members. The main source of the Wraiths' income is from the spoils of their raids. They sometimes go to big cities for transportation contracts, but are notoriously unreliable mercenaries. They often break agreements and keep the loot they were supposed to transport or keep the passengers either for ransom or for their own enjoyment. Nomads wrapped in shiv, corporations and drifters, they form a complete whole. Remove one part, the delicate balance topples. Here in the Aldecaldos, it all stays in the family. Classic dilemma. What comes first, family or the outside world? This family will go to hell and back. The Aldecado family was the first true nomad family to form during the 1990s as Los Angeles turned into a war zone. Juan Aldecado started out in the defense industry and much of the extended Aldecado family depended on Juan for various needs. Juan led his family as he migrated from the US to Mexico City and as time went on, his leadership became stronger. The Aldicados returned to the US in 2015 with an increased number of nomads. By 2077, the Aldicados are one of the two nomad groups inhabiting the Badlands. They have a long history of frequent conflict and warring with other nomad group, the Wraiths. Unlike their aggressive rivals, the Aldicados are more open to making deals with the player in game. The Aldicados are known to make temporary camps in the Badlands and Desert, but never as a single group simultaneously. Their caravans operate in the Free States on the West Coast, where they transport passengers and merchandise over state borders in large, well-guarded convoys. Cyberware and other equipment used by the gang include reflex boosters and heavily modified cars and bikes. In addition to scavenging and hiring themselves out as manual farm laborers, Aldicados also engage in bootlegging and transporting stolen goods. Some clans and families focus solely on smuggling and delivering their packages all along the Nomad Trail, all the way to the twin crime cities, which are Chicago and Phoenix. Everyone in this city lives in their own bubble, and either you fly high or sink into quicksand. 